<clears throat> just wait a few seconds just to make sure that the stream is actually live. I think we're good. I think we are live. All right. Well, let's let's get started. Um, let me add my. All right. Can everyone see that? Okay. Everyone. Okay. Perfect. So, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Christopher Norline. I'm the Director of Development and Communications here at the ARC Baltimore. Um, I am wearing a blue um, uh, patterned shirt and a gray uh, sport coat uh, and brown glasses, and I've got very short hair, and I'm in my office full of artwork. Um, so welcome to our Curator Night event, Bridging the Disability and Art Communities. This event is part of our larger Art in the Round event to be held on October 22nd at 7 p.m. Learn more about this event at www.thearcbaltimore.org where we have artist profile videos, a virtual gallery of the 50 selected pieces of art, an opportunity to register to bid on the art where bidding starts this Friday. And lastly, you can donate or create your own fundraiser for our Together Again mission appeal. We quickly wanna thank our presenting sponsor, Scientific Plant Service, for supporting this year's virtual event once again. And thank you to our top patrons, Total Wine and More, Summit Financial, The Miter Box, HNB Services, Wegmans, Whiting Turner, United Healthcare and Ten Oaks Homes. We have an exciting hour of discussion that will not disappoint. So let's jump right in. We are fortunate to have six prominent art leaders with us here tonight. Each curator selected a piece of artwork from our Art in the Round exhibit and will discuss why they made their decision. In addition, they will share the diversity, equity, access and inclusion initiatives at their respective institutions. Lastly, our friend and panelist, George Sissel, will lead a discussion regarding the importance of always including access as part of the diversity, equity, and inclusion discussion, particularly in the art community. For those of you joining us on YouTube, we hope that you are commenting and chatting and letting us know what you think about the artwork and the wonderful remarks that I'm sure we'll hear from all of our curators. Um, so first off is Khabibi Ajanku. Khabibi is the Urban Arts Leadership Director and Equity and Inclusion Director at the Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance, an independent curator based in Baltimore and the founding mother of the Baltimore-based Sankofa Dance Theater. She is also the resident curator for the Douglas Myers Museum. Uh, please note that there are full bios for all of our curators on our event website. Khabibi selected Paula and the Strays by Julian Hinman. Khabibi, what drew you to that piece? Well, thank you. First of all, I want for anyone who might need, um, or this might be helpful to describe what I look like. I am a, a dark skinned African American woman. I am a, a gray haired, uh, dark skinned African American woman. My clothes, ethnic and brightly colored. I do love to wear ethnically charged items. So you will find me with large earrings and a head wrap on most occasions like I have on tonight. I also wear glasses and I have on a dark lipstick, a dark, deep dark uh, plum lipstick. So that gives you a visual. I chose Paula and the Strays by Julian Hinman. He, uh, was known as Jules Hinman. I, I was drawn to this piece because it is joyous, number one. Um, and I think we are in a time where 
there's so much confusion. I like the the this is kind of a lark. It's lighthearted. It it is it's a nod to pop culture. It is an opportunity to cross genre and draw in young folk and in um, other generations. So that is what drew me to this. These uh, lively characters that have crossed arms and attitudes and expressions on them. So I, I just enjoyed it. Thank you, Kabibi. Um, so next up uh, is Bertice Padola. Bertice Padola is the owner and founding director of Gallery Mertice, an emerging blue chip gallery and art advisory specializing in 20th and, tw 20th and 21st century American art with a focus on work created by African-American artists. Badola possess, sorry, possesses over 30 years of experience as a curator, gallerist, and art consultant. Mertice selected The Zulu Women by Lisa Kearney. Mertice, can you tell us why you like this painting? Yes, but first I would like to say thank you for organizing this. I really feel very honored to be a part of this discussion. And I also wanted to thank George for inviting me to be part of the curator panel um, that's involved in tonight's program. So I was really struck by the Zulu woman created uh, by Lisa Kearney. Um, what drew me to this piece, first of all, is it resonated with me personally because I am the oldest of three girls. So image images where there are three, uh, ten, I tend to be very intrigued by them. It also spoke to me because I am an African-American woman. Uh, I failed to describe myself, I will do that now. I am wearing a dark blue blouse, um, wearing glasses with light blue frames. I am fair skinned, I am part Native American as well. Um, and I have short curly hair, <laughs> my little Afro, TWA, teeny weeny Afro. <laughs> so I'm getting back to Lisa's lovely painting here of these three Zulu women uh, and why I appreciate it so. Um, it's so bright and colorful. I don't know if Lisa is of African descent, but her work certainly speaks to perhaps her love of African-American culture or African culture because Zulu women are from quasi Natal in Africa, Southern Africa. Um, I love that the head wraps are the color of them, which are indicative of the uh, traditional colors that are worn by the Zulu women and that the, it has such depth and uh, texture when you look at the jewelry. She's adorned them very beautifully and I love their facial expressions. So there are many reasons why I think that this piece is so very special. I love, again, the depth, like the background of the work, the soft, beautiful colors, which the contrast between that and the foreground we see the, the skin color of the women. So I love the contrast that she uh, was able to create. So the composition of this piece, I think is very beautifully done. And um, I'm just, I think that Lisa did an incredible job of expressing the Zulu women. That's great, thank you, Mertiz. Um, so the next curator is Sammy Hoy. Sammy Hoy is the president of Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA. He is an experienced and innovative higher education leader and an advocate for art and design education and creative professionals as drivers in social, economic, and cultural advancement. At MICA, he has ushered in its creative entrepreneurship efforts, steered its mission, and its vision rearticulation. Sammy selected Row Houses by Gregory Bannister. Sammy, Sammy, can you tell us a little more about your selection? Sure. Uh, 
Sure. And thank you so much, Chris, for the introduction. And hello to everyone. Uh, I am a, a middle-aged Asian American man with short black hair and a pair of clear glasses. I'm wearing a red and gray pattern shirt and a, a black jacket. I'm in my office with a bookcase behind me. I think um, uh, Matisse and uh, Kabibi definitely have much more colorful and vibrant backgrounds than, than I do. Uh, so first, uh, let me say that there are many wonderful art pieces um, in um, this exhibition of Art in the Round. The fact that each of the six very discerning curators can all easily find several pieces of work that we uh, can talk about says a lot about the creativity and the talent display here. So congratulations to all the artists. I'm lucky to be able to talk about a Gregory Bannister's row houses in Baltimore painting uh, because, well, it's just a terrific painting. Now, I have not had the pleasure to learn from the artist what he wants to say uh, with the imagery. So what I will share now is just how I take, what I take away as an admiring viewer. I'm not speaking on behalf of Gregory. To me, he has created a powerful and moving urban portrait of people and community, and he has captured the spirit of many Baltimore row house neighborhoods very vividly. Houses, as we know, are empty shells made alive by the people who live in them. Gregory's row houses are alive. They are living, breathing forms, just opposed to each other, like people on a bus packed from side to side and from top to bottom. To me, the house frames are like faces and heads because the windows and doors are rendered by Gregory in a way that they suggest eyes, browses, noses, and mouths. These are animated row houses that are either talking to each other or they are singing together like a gospel choir. The overall warm tone scheme of the painting also vibrates with energy. For me, there's definitely like a jamming, jamming vibe um, in this very rhythmic and very musical painting. There's also um, um, a lot of muscularity and grittiness in this painting as well. I cannot call this a pretty picture, but I found it beautiful because it exudes what I perceive to be a proud defiance. It is a raw, honest, and owned, owned as an ownership portrait, portrayal of a neighborhood. I cannot imagine someone from outside of a community to have done this painting. There is something so real, so authentic, and so loving in how the image is made that I believe it could only have been done by someone who has lived inside this neighborhood and who knows, who knows the good, the bad, the beautiful, and the ugly of it all, and who calls it home. Gregory has made a painting that makes me think as much as it makes me feel. Now, isn't that what good art is about? To make us think and make us feel. So thank you, Gregory, for sharing this painting with me and with all of us. Wow, thank you, Sammy, that was wonderful. Um, so next is Amy Cavanaugh Royce. Amy Cavanaugh has been the executive director at Maryland Art Place since January 2012. Within her first years, Amy steered Matt back to its original home, housing a variety of creative businesses and individual artists. Under her leadership, Matt has fast become a cultural hub in the Bromo Arts and Entertainment District. Amy selected It's a Brand New Day by Crystal Wagner. Um, and I would like to add that on our website, uh, on the event page, we just uploaded a beautiful artist profile of Crystal and the creation of this particular painting. So I encourage you to go uh, see that and get to know Crystal and how wonderful of an artist and person she is. Um, so Amy, can you tell us a little bit more about your reaction to this piece? Yes, um, sure. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to um, thank you for having me here tonight um, and also uh, describe what I look like where I am. So um, I am a middle-aged woman with uh, brown blondish hair in braids that is tied back. I'm in a black blouse in my office. I have a beautiful piece of art behind me. Um, that was created by an artist in Baltimore. It's got blues and pinks and whites in it. 
Um, to my right is my cello, which you can sort of only see a little bit of. I'm a lifelong cellist. Um, I am a white woman with dark brown eyes. And um, yeah, I think that pretty much describes what I look like. Um, so uh, I really love this painting. Um, I will say that um, I come from a, a long line of painters in my family. And my grandfather had painted a rooster um, that has been in my family's collection and now hangs at my sister's house. And as soon as I saw this rooster, I think um, like so many things, art kind of takes us back to family and um, the things that we grow up and experience. And uh, I, I love this painting uh, for a number of reasons. One is, is you know, that nostalgia that I felt as soon as I saw it. Um, which art can do, um, but also the detail in the rooster, the little feathers, um, the beautiful tree to the left, um, just kind of sit sitting off to the side there. Um, it made me think about agriculture and um, our relationship with food and farming, um, which is so relevant today. Um, and then also there's just a beautiful sunset. So I think Crystal did a really good job of sort of um, bringing that sort of farm to table feeling with the painting, if I can say that, and um, just did such a wonderful job with the colors, the sky blue and pinks, you know, it's just like waking up on a farm. It's really, really um, beautiful. So um, it's for those reasons that I chose this piece and I don't know Crystal, but I can't wait to watch the process. So that'll be really exciting. Um, Anyway, congratulations to uh, Crystal and to all the artists uh, this evening. Thank you, Amy. That was wonderful. Um, so next is Kirk Shannon Butts. Kirk currently serves as the Public Art and Curation Manager for the Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts, overseeing the Baltimore City's vast art collection, the 1% for Art Initiative, and curating BOPA's portfolio of art spaces, including the Bromo Seltzer Arts Tower, School 33, and Top of the World. Kirk selected Calmness by Nadia, Nadia Strasbaugh. Kirk, can you tell everyone why you made that selection? Yes. First, I want to say thank you to George and Chris for having me be a part of this esteemed panel. Um, everyone here, I do look up to in some way and get inspiration in um, professional capabilities from. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, as for my description, I'm 5'10", brown skin, African-American male, slim, brown eyes, and I'm wearing an um, Artscape t-shirt and looking forward to Artscape coming back in 2022 to Baltimore. And um, uh, regarding the piece, um, it was tough for me because, um, you know, I enjoy research. I enjoy looking uh, at images. So to select one is very hard. Um, and this one really spoke to me um, from the sea of color in all sorts of shapes. Like you've seen houses, you've seen a chicken, you've seen <laughs> Zulu women. So this one was really simple for me and abstract. I love the abstract nature of it. Um, the composition, uh, it felt like a flower at summer. Um, it was summer when I was looking through this. So I spent a lot of time in the backyard in a garden. So it was kind of like a destruction of a flower. And um, I love the sort of um, scale from black to white. And it was just a really beautiful piece. And I did have an opportunity to watch Nadia's um, piece from last year on YouTube and get to know her via virtual world. And she was um, talking about how she's from Romania and she's been here for 20 years in America and she's still learning English. And I thought that's such an amazing thing that art, you don't, it doesn't matter what language you speak and it doesn't matter what your disabilities are, your capabilities are. This is beautiful and anyone can see that. So, um, that's why I selected it. Thank you, Kirk. I'm glad you were able to see the video. Um, it's one of, one of many that we have on the event page. So hopefully everyone else can see Nadia's work as well. 
Um, so next up is George. Um, last but not least, um, he's a friend of the Ark Baltimore, um, and he's been instrumental in bridging the Ark and many of the people we support with various Baltimore art institutions to explore and create art. Through this partnership, he has built lasting friendships with many artists with disabilities from the ARC through his participation in the group visits to the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Walters Art Gallery and School 33, and many, many other institutions. George is the curator in residence emeritus at MICA, who has mounted groundbreaking exhibitions and taught courses in the fine arts and humanities for close to 50 years. He founded and directed the Contemporary as well as the Exhibition Development Seminar, Curatorial Studies Concentration, and MFA in Curatorial Practice at MICA. George selected Cicada Season by Sarah Davey. Uh, George, and I, pardon me for using this, but what, what's the buzz about this piece? <laughs> I so. knew you were, you, were, you were just waiting for that opportunity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for some of us. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you to my, all my panelists for agreeing to be uh, such a, a crucial part of tonight's discussion. So I am a senior white man with a beard and short hair, and I have a colorful flowered shirt and I'm sitting in my study. So cicada season, well, it's interesting, like Kirk was saying in terms of looking at everyone's work, I at first thought this was an abstract piece, right? <laughs> So that was my original attraction to it. Like, oh, this is great. There's very few abstract works that people submit. And then, of course, the more I got engaged with the piece, I realized there were all these different layers of imagery going on that together, of course, then I saw the title, which then gave it away in terms of cicada season. Um, and so then, of course, my, my second, second experience of the piece really was looking at the imagery as related to the title. And then looking at that, um, the position, the positioning on the this this tree trunk, that there's layers and layers of cicadas on top of each other. Of course, which we all experienced last year, that one could not even sort of distinguish one from the other after a while. And there was layers through their wings and and their tentacles. And I just felt that she really captured uh, that that uh, almost sound, <laughs> that the sound of the cicadas that we had um, in terms of them being layered on each top of each other and not knowing where one begins and one ends. But I guess also um, I was really fascinated more I looked at it by this inherent geometry within each of, of the heads. And there's a, there's a real, formality and the composition when you look at it very carefully and how she has constructed, not just the bodies and the composition with the tree trunk, you know, at a Y like that and how she's positioned the cicadas, but also within each of the individual cicadas, um, she has just, I mean, it'd be a great uh, study for someone who's studying architecture or, or design to look at how she has taken uh, these anatomical heads and really deconstructed them into geometry. The last thing I want to say is to remind people, and thank you, thank you, Sarah, for doing this, um, is that all the artworks, the six you're hearing about tonight from our choices and the other 44 that are going to be in the auction, all those works, of course, are available to bid on, but also that 60% of the auction price does go to all the artists. I think that's important for everyone to, to know that. Thank you, George. Thank you. Um, we had a great uh, uh, comment from Megan McMillan, our friend at the Miter Box, who professionally frames many of these pieces, that if I could quickly share the dimensions and the medium would be helpful. Um, so Cicada Season is 20 by 16, um, and it's marker on paper. Um, Nadia's piece is 20 by 16 as well, and it's acrylic on canvas. Um, Crystal's piece, It's a Brand New Day, is 19 by 23, also acrylic on canvas. And let's see, Julian's piece is 8 by 8, pencil on canvas board. Uh, Lisa's The Zulu Women is 16 by 20, acrylic on canvas. And then Gregory's piece is also 20 by 16, acrylic on canvas. Okay, so let me unshare this. Oh. We still there?
Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing the, the, screen, the screen. Hopefully we're all in gallery view at this point. Um, we are. Okay, great. Um, so thank you, George. Um, I'm going to turn this discussion uh, over to you um, that asks the question, where does the Baltimore art community succeed in the diversity, equity, access, and inclusion space? This is a perfect time for us to check in with our curators, right? To ask that question within your spaces, right? What's happening in your world as related to access? And uh, Kurt, I'd like to start this portion of the event with you. Can, can you tell us what things are happening with BOPA as it relates to access? Well, you know, I came into BOPA last year having left the gallery in Baltimore City Hall during the pandemic. And for me, it was very important to keep all bodies safe. So I had did um, very little programming last year, but uh, we did do some outdoor pop-ups to keep it very modern. And um, obviously everything was accessible to everyone in terms of um, where we placed it and being a not-for-profit and coming from the governmental space, um, we are always operating under the guidelines of um, a D ADA as well as um, um, just coming from a space of wanting everyone to be able to see the art. Um, and so going forward, I'm working on the, the schedule we're just for, I'm finalizing for 2022 at Promo Arts Tower and at Top of the World, our programming for there. So we'll be releasing that. But um, uh, going forward, you know, when I was researching and reading for today, and I read the articles you sent, George, that they, I did not know, I probably knew in some way, but I did not know that um, July is um, Disabilities Awareness Month. So uh, when I program, for for the municipality um it's all about programming based upon what goes around in society whether it's black history month whether it's women's history month whether it's um latino or hispanic heritage month which is happening right now i always create and curate to reflect that and so um i'm definitely going to be curating july as um you know, Disabilities Her um, Awareness Month um, going forward in some way. It might not happen specifically for 2022 because it's kind of set, um, but definitely for 2023, it will be a show just like this one, um, but um, curated and, and fancy and shiny <laughs> so the artists can truly shine and have their moment because the art as you saw and, and as curators we saw is very good on so many levels. Um, not just the personal level for the piece we selected, but the the when I looked at um, Nadia again, when her process, she um, I don't know who's seen her video, but her process is that she she'll take like a uh, she'll drip the paint in these bars, and then she puts a string on them all, and she pulls them down, so you get this beautiful effect of the the the, the paint and the colors all coming together. And um, it's very special. So um, I would love to, you know, have her be able to do an artist talk and discuss it in public for herself. That's wonderful to hear. That's really, really exciting news. And I also just want to remind people in terms of with BOPA that, and the relationship with, with Art Baltimore is that, that one of their uh, venues, School 33 Arts Center, um, we worked a lot with uh, doing uh, visits, gallery visits, and actual workshops with our art clients there on the last couple, couple of years before COVID. So we thank you for that partnership. Okay, Amy, um, I know your leadership of, at, at MAP has bought with it a, definitely a commitment to artists and audiences with disabilities. Um, do you have anything you would like to share with us about that? Um, sure, yeah, I mean, we've had a lot going on over um, the, the last few years, and, and George, I know you came to our show at Hotel Indigo with Make Studio, um, who focuses on artists um, with disabilities, and um, so that's just one partnership that we've had over the last um, four or five years. We um, try to do our best um, to make 
opportunities available to artists with disabilities. As example, we don't charge make studio submission fees um, ever. We let them submit without having to make those payments, which could be burdensome to them. Um, so we're always looking at ways that we can lend a hand. And that's just one way. Um, our current show actually has a very historical um, commitment to the LBGTQ community and Baltimore subculture. Um, it's the retrospective of the 14 Karat Cabaret, which ran down in our basement for yeah. so long. Um, and the, the founder of that, Laura Dragol, has really committed herself to um, the cabaret and inclusion. Um, it's, it's a really interesting show. So um, one of the installations in the show um, is an AIDS altar, and it's basically an homage to all those that perished in the AIDS epidemic um, and uh, that had performed or passed through MAP um, during these last 20, 25 years. Um, there's also um, a giant swing. So if you can't see, you can come swing. Um, it's st installed in the middle of the gallery and it's um, in the center of a giant heart that's covered in flowers. Um, so we're trying to focus on um, continuing these sort of types of experiences that map, um, especially ones that sort of stemmed out of the work that came out of the basement. Um, there, uh, you know, there are other things that MAP has supported, such as the Trans Modern um, Festival, which, you know, defies cultural normative practices. And I think, you know, we're just going to be diving in as a, an organization more and more over the next few years um, to figure out ways that we can be more inclusive in our programming and also bring work more outside of the gallery. That's something that we've been working because not everyone can get downtown. Um, so we're trying to make it so that it's easier for people um, to see art uh, maybe at the mall or um, we've done that before where we work for the mall or we work um, out at Green, in Green Spring Valley or just bringing, you know, art um, to different locations. Um, so those are the, you know, just a handful of things that we're focused on. It's our 40th year, um, as you know, so there's a lot to celebrate, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, uh, and, and if you get an opportunity, please come down to MAP right now. The show is, is really, really fun. Yeah. Well, happy anniversary. And also, I just want to, I'm glad you uh, really talked about your relationship with Make Studio because many of the artists um, from Make Studio do submit to Art in the Round every year. We have quite a few this year that got accepted into the jury um, because also there are some overlap services between ARC and Make Studio. So it's good to to hear MAPS programming that you're doing with them. Uh, Sammy, uh, can you catch us up on how MICA's mission is implementing these important values that we've been talking about? Uh, yeah, no, thank you, George. Um, I think, George, since you are a MICA community member and family member, you know this, but I'll share this with the uh, larger audience here. Uh, so at MICA, uh, we have a college-wide commitment to what we call DEIG, or Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Globalization. It doesn't have the A in it for accessibility, but it's very integral to that. Uh, at MICA and also in the field of uh, education generally, the commitment to accessibility, physical and intellectual disability is integral to the I, the inclusion. So our administration, faculty, staff, and students really all embrace the value of A very, very deeply in our I, <laughs> or in DIG. As a college, as you can imagine, uh, we uh, must have support uh, and accommodations for disability and teaching and learning in our facilities. Um, but it doesn't mean that we are doing it right everywhere and all the times. Uh, in fact, we have uh, historical buildings that still need to become truly accessible uh, and not just accessible, but really accessible in a way that it um, preserves the user's um, comfort and dignity. I think that's a very important uh, you know, aspect and we have still some way to go. And we also have the, I think if we all honest with each other, we all have the inevitably dominant ableist culture that it takes time to pivot and dismantle. And so we are working on that as a community. So I would say our biggest commitment as a college community is that we are aware that it's a committed and continuous journey that never ends. And um, in terms of knowledge and services, we are always learning and expanding. Thank you. I'm proud, and I'm certainly proud to be part of that, the community. But I also want to remind you bring a lot people, to us in that respect. So thank you. 
I also wanted to let people know in terms of that two years ago, uh, some of the funds from Art in the Round went to funding a fellowship at MICA with the Curatorial Practice Graduate Program. It's a paid fellowship that, uh, that will continue. Uh, COVID unfortunately stopped it, but it was an amazing uh, partnership between uh, MICA's Curatorial Practice Program and ARC um, that really sort of expanded the boundaries of what the curriculum even is at an art school. Um, well, that's so, been a good way to resume that, George. We are so right after right after we're allowed. Well, Mike is ready for us. I know that, but but Arc needs to get there with the vaccination and, and their tri field trips. We were definitely are resuming it because we we have the mon the the funds in place from last year. So, um, Mertice, uh, I know Gallery Mertice's artists come from a very diverse backgrounds. Is there anything you would like to add about your own? professional or personal connections to these issues we're talking about? Yes, I mean, uh, it's interesting to hear Sammy talk about the direction of the university and its efforts to be more inclusive. Um, and, and one thing that he said was really key is being in the institution being housed in historic building, which is part of our challenge here as well. Uh, we are, the gallery is in a building that was built in the late 1800s. So we are not as accessible as we would like to be, um, but we do, um, whenever able, accommodate individuals who may be challenged with their mobility. And that is because we have stairs leading up to the front entrance of the gallery. So what we have um, offer on many occasions is to allow people to come in through our back entrance, which there are no stairs. And then, so they can uh, experience the, uh, the gallery is divided into like three sections, the front gallery, the middle space, and then the rear gallery space. So for those who are not able to walk up the two um, stairs leading into the main gallery area, they can certainly come in and enjoy the exhibition that's, or the works that are being featured in the rear gallery space. We try to also have um, audio, visual, some components that uh, uh, individuals can experience when the videos allow, we try to have captions. So we're still working um, at being better able to serve individuals who are dis, um, differently able, as we call it. And so, you know, we're, we're really working and making a concerted effort to be more inclusive. Um, currently, I have uh, curated an exhibition that's taking place in Washington, D.C. Now, it's not in Baltimore, but it's an important exhibition and one that is fully accessible. It's being shown at the Smith Center for Healing at, in the Arts at the Joan Hisaoka gallery. And it was interesting to read uh, the mission of the ARC Baltimore, because in many ways, it is in line with the mission of the Smith Center in terms of its services and um, you know, the way in which they believe that art is an important part of healing socially and in, in building community. So um, you know, we're, we're making strides. We are making a concerted effort to do better. And, and certainly the body of artists that we represent is very diverse. And I would like to say that many years ago, uh, we featured an exhibition here that was uh, curated specifically for individuals who were visually impaired. Um, the artists created works that were rich in texture, heavily layered in paint in this uh, palette night. And in, during that exhibition, everyone that visited was encouraged to interact, to engage with the artwork. So typically you go into an art space and it's hands off, but everyone was encouraged to touch, to feel the outline of the figures or the flower and to, and we ha also had sculptures that were created by another artist. And we invited everyone to touch the, the sculptural pieces. So we received, um, you know, just praise for that. 
And, and there was a lot of great excitement around the fact that we had um, invited a, a community in that often is not able to experience art in that way. Thank you, Mertis. And I, I, it's great that, that you went into such detail about what the gallery is doing, because I think a lot of people don't understand that you're more than just a commercial gallery uh, for, for us in the, here in the community. And also, I think, you know, it's, it's very moving to hear you share personally, you know, your commitment to the Smith Center for Healing and the Arts in DC and how you see that connected to what we're doing with, with ARC here in Baltimore. Um, Kabibi, so please tell us about the new access initiative you as the director of GBC's Equity and Inclusion and your staff have launched recently. Well, you know, I know that you know all about it because I am, I am just honored that you are part of the Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance uh, DEAI um, committee. So as the board for um, GBCA has uh, a committee that is to making sure that um, the organization stays in line with it, what it says it's going it does what it says it's going to do in regard to diversity, equity, access, and inclusion. And I, as the, um, I'm the director of equity and inclusion, so I'm honored to work very closely with this um, committee, and I'm honored to make sure that you, they, I care vice is taken to heart and carried out and acted upon. Under that, um, that being said, what we did, we accomplished quite a bit during these COVID shut-in months, years. How long has it been? It's been too long. But we have worked closely with the staff and our, our staff is, is really quite um, first and articulate and, and ready and engaged and so our annual training has taken on a few different phases this year quite nicely. So from the standpoint of, of gender and, um, and inclusion in that direction, we had staff members just really do um, some conversation about incorporating the use of pronouns and respecting the people's are to their usage of pronouns. So we did that very specifically with our, our staff. We have a, a, a rather small staff, but we want to um, encourage best practice. You know, we want to make sure that we're consistent. In regard to uh, race equity, you know, we've gone through so much in this country over the past 400 years, and it was, certainly was amplified um, through the over these COVID months through just unnecessary violence. And so we um, did a group reading of the uh, Isabel uh, Wilkerson's book, Cast, and just really just dissected that, talked about that. And so we were able to pull that lens of race um, in very specifically to the happenings in Baltimore, the happenings in this country, worldwide. So um, racial equity. And then in regard to accessibility and, and the conversation about people being differently able, um, George well, welcomed Robin in to introduce her to our process. I already knew Robin, but, but Robin did um, some really wonderful training for our organization because we want, again, to be consistent and best practice. Um, the other thing that I do for GBCA is stand at the helm of the Urban Arts Leadership, which is a training that's specifically about encouraging the uplift of emerging leaders of color for the arts sector. And that's really, really important because while we look in, you know, we oftentimes can look around we interact with and we see a very diverse landscape but if you pull back the lens we're talking about three percent 
people of color in, you know, so the landscape is, it's not so diverse. So I've been honored to train leaders in that direction. Um, it doesn't really stop there because as a feeder to that program, I am working on the college level. So I teach, I, I've been able to um, teach in the fibers department at, at MICA, talking about the connection of West African culture to um, the beauty of natural dye. Um, and so that is an accessibility statement in regard, in my heart, and I think. Also in regard to emerging leaders on the campus of Coppin State University. And then there's the gallery, because it's important um, for the gallery to remain, the gallery in Fells Point that I work out of, um, to be accessible as well. So it is a third floor gallery, but there is an elevator that gives everyone access and the ways are open. And, and um, uh, as I curate, I'm mindful about the levels of the art so that we can do as much as we can. And then the options that are available for those who have not we've had a need for safety as kurt said over these past months so there is a way to access what's going on in the galley gallery from the website so there there are virtual um options to view exhibitions and there are um uh options on youtube that have uh voices and artist work and so that that accessibility uh, um, is captioned um, whenever I am able to get that done and you know just really this is um, attending to DEAI as well locally and globally because Sammy brought that into focus is an ongoing effort we I've, we will always keep working. And so um, I just try to work in every direction that I can. And well, thank, thank you for your continued work and commitment. I like to also encourage people to look at yesterday's GBCA's newsletter that Jeannie Hell sent out on, yesterday on Tuesday to see the whole newsletter this week is really addressing the wonderful work that Kabibi and her staff are doing. Um, Lastly, I'd just like to briefly share a bit of, of my role in the Baltimore art community as, um, since my retirement, um, that I made a commitment to ensuring that access in our art space happens. Um, and this is a lot what this Curator's Choice panel is about uh, last year and this year. Um, so after this event, if you log into Art in the Rounds Together Again, Fund the Mission campaign, you can check out my individual fundraising page, which includes many examples that we've been talking about tonight between ARP and our Baltimore institutions. And of course, you're welcome then to donate also to the camp campaign at the same time. So Chris, are we ready for the last part, our last part? Absolutely. Um, so, um, the, the question that George and I want to pose, um, and um, how can art institutions ensure that access is part of their culture and everyday conversations? Um, and, that, and that means access that is beyond just um, a strict adherence to ADA guidelines. Um, uh, it, it provides a range of um, experiences for a variety of audiences who may identify as disabled, neurodiverse, indigenous, queer, et cetera. And that also provides diverse sensory experiences beyond just the visual. And I think many of the curators tonight have touched on a lot of those points in that it goes beyond just making sure that people can physically access the space. It's, it's sensory, it's um, um, making sure that, that these different groups are, have access to both um, basically access to that world and, and however that means um, in a variety of ways. Um, so um, I wanted 
to open that up um, briefly, we have about 10 minutes left. So um, if, if we could keep comments brief, because we do want to close with one last question after this. But, but if anyone just wants to say, to talk, maybe just Chris, just to sort of summarize for everyone, and then we'll let everyone uh, chime in when, when they like, is basically how can, can Baltimore's institutions ensure that access is part of their culture and everyday conversations. Yes. And we just open yeah. it up for the next few yeah, minutes. So if if I can. may uh, jump in, I think that it's really um, not how, but how, 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 how we must do it nowadays because um, uh, with the, um, the inequitable distribution of pandemic impact with the Me Too movement and with the Black Lives Matter, uh, the world is calling for equity and justice everywhere to be pervasive, to be systemic, and disability equity and justice is just very much part of social justice. And so, uh, as Chris points out, it's not about meeting um, like a requirement, like code, anything. It's really fundamental to our mission and vision, who we see we want to be, what kind of role we must play in society, and therefore how, how we must embrace that uh, comprehensive and fundamental inclusion, which must include uh, the recognition and advocacy and support for accessibility. I, I, I'd like to add to that. I, I think that that was brilliantly stated, stated, Sammy. And I think that what we're talking about is lifestyle shifts. You know, we say best practice, but best practice means lifestyle. It means the way we do things each and every day. And, and um, you know, there are a myriad of things that help to support that mindfulness. We about including, that means we have to care. You know, that really does mean that we have to care. And that's what you're talking about, Sammy. You know, we, we pull back the lens and we are thinking about how we care in consistent care about everybody that we impact or intersect with. And KBB, as everyone here knows, especially you, the, the root of the word curator is is care. That's right. Yeah. I wanted to jump in and say that, you know, our world is one of elitism. So in glamour and in, in, in beauty. So we really have to pull the lens, lens back really far and include ourselves in terms of curators, in terms of gallerists and um, expose it all, you know. Um, one of the wonderful things about working in the municipal um, space, um, I did a lot of um, tours of children in, in the school system. And I remember I had this one show up and, you know, the kids were always very stiff. And, um, and one of the kids asked me something about, well, we can't touch the art. And, and I said, no, there is, this, in this show, you can touch the art. And when I tell you every single kid just ran <laughs> There's <laughs> the art. It was unbelievable. And of course, not every piece was touchable. So I had to pull them back in and like this one you can touch, this one you can't. So I feel like that's where we need to be for everyone, no matter what age you are, like you spoke of earlier about um, Martise, about every, you know, being able to engage with the art. But I think there has to be some sort of, you know, commitment and curatorial awareness that sometimes you may need art that people can truly engage with. And that means being able to touch it. Yes, Kurt, just to pick up where you left off there. Um, I think that the efforts must also be intentional and deliberate and consistent. And uh, there is, uh, a woman who visits the gallery. She hasn't been here since the pandemic hit, but she, she's someone that has come off and on since the gallery was established. And I wanna share this story with you because it's about elitism and accessibility. So she, in her appearance, she may be uh, challenged with housing. I don't know that she is homeless, but she came to the gallery one day and she was a bit distraught because she said she had left another gallery space. The individuals inside looked and saw her through the glass door 
and would not let her in. And she came to my space and said, I know that I'm always welcomed here. And I said, yes, you are. So sometimes people, we put up barriers not knowing that we are sending a message, perhaps not verbally, but we somehow through our actions are telling people that they are not valuable and not welcomed. And I said to her, you are always welcome here because in this environment, she is surrounded by beauty and kindness. And my staff all know that regardless of a person's stat um, status in life or social status or position wherever they stand, that they are to be treated kindly and embraced because this space is accessible to all. And this place became a refuge for her, a place where she could come and view art and feel welcomed. Thank, thank you, Mertiz. That was, that was beautiful. Um, um, I want to close, since we have a few minutes left, with our final question that really is um, at the heart of this event and the history that the Arc Baltimore has with George. Um, and it's how do we bridge the disability and art communities? And I think we've touched on many ways and the ways that are already happening in Baltimore. Um, but I just want to share briefly about how uh, our relationship with George came to be. Um, and so at the ARC, we, we help people pursue passions uh, in their life. And whether that's work at home with family in their neighborhoods, um, part of that for many is art. And George just happened to walk through our door as a prospective volunteer a few years, probably about four or five years ago. And that has now blossomed into such an incredible friendship and partnership where he has opened doors to us that we as disability organization staff could probably never open ourselves. Um, and that has led to the fellowship at MICA that he had referenced, um, uh, many visits to School 33, the Walters Art Gallery, a formal partnership with the Baltimore Museum of Art where uh, artists with developmental disabilities are visiting the gallery, um, they're experiencing the art, they're creating their own art with instruction afterward. Um, and George is there every step of the way. Um, you can always count on him being there. And I think it's gonna take an investment from someone like George who's in the, in the art community to help bridge that gap to organizations like the ARC, Make Studio, um, Art with a Heart, variety of other wonderful, wonderful art organizations that intersect with the disability community. Um, and I just wish we could clone George and assign- You, you don't need to clone me. I'm going to uh, interrupt you there. Okay. You don't need to clone me. You've got him right here, right? <laughs> right. We had him lot. We had five other amazing curators last year from institutions, right? And the year, so this, this, this is the bridge. They're the bridge. Mm -hmm. These people here are the bridge, right? And, and Baltimore Playworks also was, has been a major partner and yes, all that and, absolutely. and doing classes with ARC uh, from different different centers. So no, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm really obviously flattered and honored with your remarks, Chris, but the bridge, the bridge, these, these are the people who are the bridge, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I, I'm, I'm just so happy to hear all of the initiatives that are happening at all of your respective institutions and the fact that it seems that the, that diversity, equity, access, inclusion is baked in to your mission. And, you know, we're, we're always evolving and we're working toward making sure that everyone has the same access, um, their voices are heard um, in every space. So that's really important. Um, so we, we are at eight o'clock. So I, I figured we'd close it up. I, I know we could probably continue to talk a little bit more, but um, on behalf of the ARC, uh, the artists with disabilities represented tonight and the many other artists in our Art in the Round exhibition, I want to thank our esteemed guests for their participation in this wonderful event and the insight they provided over the last hour. Uh, we're so grateful to the people that are viewing in via our YouTube stream, and we hope that you really enjoyed this past hour as much as I did. Um, so we hope to see many of you back a week from Friday for our Art in the Round uh, virtual event. Um, 
There are more details on our website, thearcbaltimore.org. Just look for the art in the round and it'll give you all the information you need. Um, so thank you again. Excuse um, me, what tell them oh, when bidding, tell them when bidding starts oh, on the auction. Yes. <laughs> thank you, George. Um, this, uh, this Friday, the 15th, bidding will open. Um, we encourage you to register in advance um, and you'll see all those prompts on the event page. And then you can start bidding on these six beautiful paintings and 44 other pieces. Um, and then you can also visit the virtual gallery and see them in sort of virtual person, I guess. So thank you to everyone uh, and, and have a wonderful night. And we hope to see you in, uh, on the 22nd for Art in the Round. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Should we stay on and then let, can you. you close off? Yeah. Um,